Hello and welcome. I'm Tracy Polowich, host of the Excellence Connection podcast, where we connect our listeners with subject matter experts, knowledge, and resources to help along their excellence journey and make organizational improvements. Today, my guest is Eric Anderson. Eric is Managing Partner at SmartPoint Advisory Services Limited, which advises entrepreneurs, principals, and senior management in the areas of capacity development, technology alignment, and performance improvement. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you, Tracy. Good to be here this morning. Yes, thank you for joining me. Yeah, that's And great. today I want to discuss with you continually improving work processes. And before we get started, I'd like to just give you an opportunity, Eric, to expand on your experience and background for our audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I first got into uh, or was tasked with initially when I was, in, you know, early in my business career, uh, dealing with quality issues. And, and ultimately, I didn't know it at the time, but what became business excellence issues in the very early 90s. And uh, I was a fairly sort of mid, mid-level manager at the time uh, in, in the transportation sector. And I was tasked with the kind of what you might today call kind of, at least as far as the firm was concerned, special projects. Uh, but we took on a, what turned out to be a really daunting task uh, to uh, implement an ISO 9002 set of standards in our facility, two of our facilities actually, in British Columbia. And so, and a year and a half later, uh, not oh, wholly acting on my own, we actually brought in an external consultant, somebody from Rolls Royce, <clears throat> who helped us, a brilliant woman who named Jean White, and and uh, uh, with her assistance, we were able to to implement uh, a fairly complex uh, quality system into uh, an organization that previously hadn't had any such thing. And, and uh, also that, that was in a heavily unionized uh, uh, labor relations environment as well. It worked out really, really well, changed a number of fundamental things about the company. Ever since then, uh, I've been one way or another engaged in quality assurance or business excellence um, and shifted sectors from, you know, in those days I was in the shipping and transportation industry, the supply chain business and more recently in software and, and information technology um, in the last 25 some odd years. I also teach uh, management consulting at Royal Roads University, and I've been doing that for 10 years, um, a couple of times a year, <clears throat> in a couple of key courses that are related to the profession. So uh, I very much enjoyed doing that, um, you know, and I keep saying yes when they ask me back, which is great. That, that is great. So yes. we'll start with just simply, what are work processes? So uh, the organizational excellence framework talks about work processes as a distinct set of uh, steps uh, that produce, that take inputs and produce outputs uh, for customers. And in fact, that's, that's uh, ostensibly um, what a process is. Uh, the customer might be um, uh, an internal customer. Very, and in fact, in most processes, quite likely is an internal customer. It's the next user of the output of the previous process. Similarly, on the input side, the input is coming from a supplier, but that supplier very well could be internal. Now, um, the, the organizational excellence, excellence framework talks about it uh, as being <clears throat> um, preventative in nature. Any process is there to ideally prevent non-conformances. So preventing uh, failures or defects or uh, otherwise unwanted, undesirable uh, aspects to the output. Um, and so the idea, of course, is to ensure you have a process that that prevents any of that from happening. Now, just, and I want to uh, refer to a couple of notes here, a couple of key things. One is the repeatability of the process and the measurability of the process. 
the repeatability is key because um, it, if the process is more ad hoc and changes from day to day or over a period of time, that is not a repeatable process. And the likelihood of any process being preventative in nature is greatly diminished by, by that characteristic. So you want to have <clears throat> uh, a repeatable process. And one of the key things for having a repeatable process is that it's understood by everyone who's involved in the process and that um, the chances of sort of altering and modifying the process in some sort of haphazard way is eliminated. Um, and then on the measurability side, which we'll talk about later, we'll talk about all these aspects in greater detail. Uh, the measurability is that, you know, are you measuring a particular step? <clears throat> what are you measuring? Uh, why are you measuring it? And on what basis, et cetera. So you need to know how this process is performing. And um, as I'll talk about later, there's, there's, you need to know sooner than the output is sort of caught as being defective or non-conforming. <laughs> so you, you want to be able to measure things along the way and have a criteria for acceptance just of that measurement alone, <clears throat> whether it's pass fail or good, bad or whatever. So that, that, is, that is the process. I will, the, what a process is. I will say that um, a good process has a strong linkage to strategy, to business strategy. Um, for example, uh, a good process can be very customer driven, certainly in my experience. Uh, new processes were put in place to satisfy an external, very large customer who wielded a great deal of influence in that operation. And um, this is, I'm referring again to the, my early days in this. That customer drove a lot of the changes that took place. And obviously the desire was to satisfy that customer. The customer has acceptance criteria that were very strict and most customers do. So um, that, that, that key aspect of hooking it to business strategy and also to, to the business plan and corporate goals, et cetera. That's all uh, uh, a part, a key process will have all of those alignments. Thanks, I like how you weaved all of that into one, you know, quite <laughs> precise area of business being the work process area, but yep. it does interrelate and interconnect with other um, aspects of business. One thing I wanted to just expand on around this is often I think people might think of work processes having to do mostly with manufacturing and, uh, you know, a, a tangible um, input and output. But I want to point out and, and get your take on this as well, that work processes can also include uh, service um, aspects of the business. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'll give an example later, but look at, and I may repeat this, but look at consulting itself. Uh, one of the suppliers to a, a consulting engagement is actually the client. And <clears throat> information from the client has to be there before the process can actually begin. So yes, very much so, uh, uh, and you know, all service, services of all, all types have multiple processes associated with them. And, uh, um, you know, banks have processes. We get exposed to those as stakeholders, as customers. Um, airlines have processes and it's, it's all service related. We're not talking about widgets being produced. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so In fact, I would say, these... sorry to interrupt, but I, I would say that, you know, over the last um, sort of couple of decades of my experience, it's all been on the service process side. Right. So where do you start with designing and documenting work processes? Uh, well, fundamentally, uh, you, you have to start with uh, the customer. Uh, this is the party who is actually the main driver of the, any acceptance criteria for the process. And so um, you need to understand what their criteria are in order to understand where your process is leading. And again, I just come back to, it could be an internal customer. So I talked a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, early in my career, we had a very large real customer out in the real world, uh, external, 
who who had very high standards of acceptance. Uh, but actually, within within an organization, any given process will have an end customer who may be just uh, the next cons the consumer of the output of the process. They will have their own acceptance criteria for for a for your process, and likewise, if it's an internal um, customer, they will have uh, be they'll be dealing with the acceptance criteria for their end consumer. Uh, customer as well. So um, that's, that's it, from a people standpoint, from a stakeholder standpoint, you want to at least start with uh, what the acceptance criteria at the, end of, at the end of the process is and who's driving that. So then after that, you, you actually start to engage really all the people who are um, engaged in the process and that uh, who touch the process. And even in, ideally, some people who may not actually touch the process. You need to have an understanding of what all, who all the stakeholders in, in a particular process are. And there will be plenty. So that, uh, in terms of actually um, beginning to document things, uh, that, that's how that works. Now, when you, um, uh, when you map processes, and we'll talk about this when I get to, to, that, to that stage, uh, you are really talking about what all the steps are, what the inputs are, et cetera, and, and how, how these customers are, what their expectations are. But um, really, you need to start with the endpoint in mind. Awesome. And so you mentioned mapping. And so yeah. can we talk a bit about that? And what, what is you bet. Um, work process mapping and how does an organization go about that? Okay, so so I'm going to just share my screen here for uh, a little bit of a discussion uh, about uh, a concept called uh, CIPOC. It's an it's an acronym. What you just before I do that, the the real purpose of mapping is to get a depiction of the process. And actually, uh, before you map any particular process, you need to have at least a, a clear idea of what's occurring at the higher level. So how many processes are actually in, in flight in your uh, organization? And there may be 10 or 40 or, you know, and you need to know at a high level what all of those processes are and where their touch points with each other are. And once you do have a clear idea of that, otherwise you're diving too deep into one process to try and uh, map it in the first place uh, in the current state. Uh, without sort of having uh, some notion of, of where it sort of sits in the, you know, in the firmament of other processes of your organization. So it's important to get that point across just to talk about, you know, which, you know, even from business unit to business unit, which organization, uh, organizational unit has its processes and how those processes fit with some other business unit's processes. Now I'll share the uh, screen and we'll talk about this so-called CIPOC concept. One way an organization can start to kind of describe what a particular process is, is by just, this is a very simple Word document that lists out a number of parameters called a CIPOC. It's a suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, and customer. And uh, it, those are the sort of five main components to a CIPOC. You get a sort of verb, verbal description of all of this in a process. And from that, you can actually begin to map adequately uh, the process. I should say that, that we talk about process improvement, but we need to start with the current state. That's a big point here, that the current state is really, uh, you know, if, you, if, if the organization's never done any of this before, it needs to get a, a, some clarity around what's actually occurring with the current process, and this is this is a good documented way of uh, documentation way of, of describing it out. Now, um, for ease of some stakeholders and users, you can actually begin to visually map this, but from a kind of a, a and I'll talk about that in a sec, but. Um, from a, a sort of completeness or comprehensiveness of the information aspect, the CIPOC is a good way to go. So it simply runs through a sequence, essentially a chain of information 
about starting from the suppliers, for example. First of all, you've got to give the process a name. Uh, so this is just a real example, and it is on the kind of more manufacturing side, but it could go to a, a service aspect as well. So this is the division two additional fabrication process. So who supplies the uh, inputs to the process? Something out of division one. And uh, the inputs are some piece of fabrication that's in a particular stage. So that's what's coming in. And this is the aspect that, that um, division two folks are dealing with when they start their end of the process. Division one has gone through its process, come up with this output called the fabrication stage A. Now the division two folks in this process of additional fabrication are dealing with various steps and sub activities within those steps potentially, and even granular tasks within those sub activities. In fact, you can go down to about four levels for practicality, but I haven't shown that. It's just, it, it's sort of conceptual enough to show th three of these levels and, uh, or a step may just be one step, you know, undertake a task and move it on and um uh, but if you know it to to uh for example describe step one without going into and or determining whether there are any actual sub activities within that step would be a mistake the key thing we're trying to map is not just the steps in the process but for later when we determine that there might be Nonconformances or other issues, other types of um, hindrances to the process. Uh, and certainly in terms of the output being uh, nonconforming. Um, and we've, if we've ignored the fact that there are a couple of sub activities in a, in a step, and even within a sub activity, there are at least a couple of tasks involved, we haven't identified where the possible uh, non-conformance, the so-called variance, and I'll talk about variance in a moment, might be occurring. So it's really important to drill these steps out and the people who are going to be able to give one the information on this are the people who actually undertake the process and uh, they know it well. And, and so as long as you're able to elicit, you know, the kind of granular information out of this you can you can really describe these steps in some detail at any rate you have you wind up uh, just in english language descript describing out all these various steps and sub activities what you come up with is the output of the process now that's assuming um, it's a single output from this process that might not quite be the case although if it's very, um, uh, you know, divergent in terms of the outputs, you're really talking about mapping a separate process for a particular different output. So let's just assume for the time being that we have one output of this process, um, fabrication stage B, okay? Now the customers uh, of the outputs are in the next process, in this case, you know, division three manager and foreman. Um, whereas the, the suppliers were uh, unnamed people in, in or unnamed processes in division one. So we've sent we've sent this this output from our process onwards to the customers internal in this regard, in this case. Now there are high level stakeholder requirements also to document and understand. And so uh, a requirement might be that the, the product must be X, uh, a certain specification. Uh, it's a functional requirement, has to, has to be able to make to, uh, you know, uh, some, other, some, other pro uh, some other product in the next process. On the service side of things, it's that, for example, uh, a consulting draft report has to be in a certain state with a certain amount of analysis available, such that the next, uh, uh, player on the team uh, who's taking it over is able to proceed with, uh, you know, finishing the report or, uh, 
if you're if you're running a consulting engagement that the um, uh, analysis has been done to the point where a certain milestone presentation can be can be uh, performed in front of the client, something like that. The requirement is to have the output of the process in a particular state. Okay, so there'll be a couple of requirements or many. Uh, at least you know, it's possible to have many requirements for a particular output. One of the concepts that we the terms we use in the software industry is the definition of done and uh, for code uh, that needs to be um, moved forward through the quality assurance chain and into production, uh, it needs to be in a done state. And that done state needs to be specified by the analysts and, and fundamentally by the business uh, who indicate, you know, for this particular piece of functionality, done means the following. So that's the requirement. Uh, so that that's how it, um, that works. One point is that in this requirement here, uh, in all these requirements, you want to, if possible, describe which process step number, just to scroll up here, the uh, requirement is really related to. So there might be a particular requirement that's really um, having to be met by, you know, sub-activity 2, 1.2 type of things. Just, just decide to try and map a particular requirement back to the actual step in the process. This SIPOC concept, and I'll just run through the rest of this quite quickly, but uh, SIPOC asks or requ requires you to um, describe who the actors are, who are the stakeholders in the process. And, uh, and the stakeholders may be the foreman and the team lead, but also maybe just um, or not just, but primarily a worker who's involved in, in a particular task. Um, and that needs to be specified, uh, at least from a kind of title standpoint, <clears throat> or names, potentially. And also it's important to know what data and information and tools are, uh, uh, the pro you know, are being used by the process. So, I mean, it could be things like uh, an inbound manifest, uh, SKU codes, quantities, um, entries to the to an enterprise resource planning system if one's in use, um, all kinds of decision support software that might be being put in use, uh, etc. And on the consulting side, to give that service example again, of course, data and information, uh, financials, for example, from the client. <clears throat> uh, where do the inputs that come, they come from uh, process you know, 4.1, the previous process? Let's assume this was process 4.2 or 5 or something like that. So uh, the inputs come from the previous process and that previous process might be actually outside the door uh, in a, in a um, manufacturing setting. So coming in bound from elsewhere entirely, but still coming through a receiving process. Um, so it's important to kind of delineate or describe where where that's um, uh, where those inputs are coming from, and there there will be criteria or should be criteria uh, that determine you know when can we start our process. Well, there's a requirement or a rule that says you can't start your process until you have a hundred units. And similarly, on the consulting side, you can't start your draft of the report until you have, you know, a certain base of analysis done from a particular business unit of your client, and uh, you've made a determination of a, a possible courses of action, etc. And so that process just can't begin until the previous um, uh, a certain quantity of information is available. So, um, but just to keep things a bit uh, sort of unitized here on, the, on a thing like a manufacturing uh, uh, level, you know, let's say you just can't start this until you have 100 units on hand uh, of a certain fabrication A. <clears throat> in other words, the, the input coming in. And then you can actually verbally uh, explain the steps that you've listed uh, 
by the name of the step up or further up in that document. At any rate, this all gets you down through the, uh, you know, where it's done, when is it complete, what does it look like at completion, um, uh, what uh, data information or services does the process produce. I've just said it's the unit that's going out the door uh, at the end. Uh, and where do they go? They go off to the next to the next division for the next process, um, or just maybe another process within the same same business unit. And so why are we doing this? What is it trying to achieve? We're, we're, this process is adding value to you know, fabrication A, like it's stage A, to make it worthy of being called stage B, basically. So we're adding value to our service or, uh, um, you know, and it may be a very short process to uh, involve here, but it's distinct enough to be given its own process or indeed it could be very uh, complex. And then finally, I mean, there's a lot that is quite useful when you're documenting this thing to understand the history behind the process. You know, we used to do uh, this particular process in a certain way back, you know, 20 years ago uh, and um, back when nothing was documented uh, and, and understand sort of how uh, it, people were trained, for example, or not trained as the case may be in a particular process. How well does it work? Sounds like a subjective question, and it sort of is, but those two questions about how well does it work and how can it be improved are, are uh, really important. And also, this is where your employee input comes in, because if you're, a, for example, a manager, you're not going to make this stuff up, uh, although you may be well aware, but you need to hear it from, from uh, uh, you know, folks actually performing the, the various steps in, in the process. And not least, of course, the output customer. And where is it documented? Or where is this uh, documentation available, et cetera? And what metrics or measurements are known? What KPIs might be known? We'll talk about KPIs in a, in a few minutes. <clears throat> but uh, these are the sorts of things that a sidebar produces now. So out of that, you can produce a, um, swim lane chart. I'm going to show you just a, an example of one here. Uh, a swim lane is just as it sounds. It's a swimmer, an actor in, a, in, a, in their lane who is performing certain tasks and passing at certain points uh, an output off to say a system. In this case, it shows a system and the system has is an actor and it's got their its own lane, its own swim lane, and off to another actor who does something else with the output. This is a little bit hard to read, but basically this is an application uh, process. So the first step by the first act, the application receiver is to process an application fee, provide a receipt back to the applicant here at the top. This is the so-called, be the client actually, and uh, uh, add the applicant to the system, you know, set the application, P, um, paid flag to true and so on and so forth, verifying dollar amounts and, and, and entering all that into, into the system. The receiver then uh, 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 receives the application, reviews the fee paid and updates the system. They make a decision as to whether the fee was correct and so on. That's, and then it terminates. That's the end of the process. The, uh, I'm just gonna show you a, um, just a, a real uh, simple kind of um, depiction of really what a lane has as a start point, which is actually uh, the terminator of the previous process uh, or can take uh, inputs from the previous process if there is one. And then there's an action that's taken. At some point, there'll be a decision that's needed, you know, yes, no, does this proceed or, or uh, has it got uh, has the input got uh, uh, non-conformancies, for example. This is where our uh, acceptance standards come in because we make a decision as to whether to receive it or not. It's non-conforming, so we, we actually kick it back and start over again. We take the next unit and so on. Uh, and we go, and so assuming we come to a decision, yes, we can continue with our actions until the end. This is all very sort of uh, uh, simplistic, but 
uh, and this gets quite complicated with multiple actors, multiple lanes, and multiple sort of hands-offs and returns of either information or, or actual uh, widgets. Now, if there's a decision no, then uh, it's we're sending this off to another actor entirely who takes action, and that's the end of that. So that's the swim lane chart. So the first document I showed you is the SIPOC, which is really uh, uh, an English language way of describing, or a verbose way of describing what the process has and does and who it satisfies or, and what you do, uh, what the rules are and what the requirements are. Um, the, the actual depiction of it schematically is a swim lane chart. It is certainly one, one way. There are other ways of, of uh, depict, schematically depicting a, a process, but this is a nice one. And actually, to be, to be clear, um, while in front of a client, you might use SIPOC later once things are really uh, clear in a detailed way, the best way is to, you know, uh, be in front of the client and start um, moving, moving, uh, I can't, I guess I can't do it on this template, but uh, moving actions around and getting everyone in a room to agree that this is the kind of schematic kind of layout of the process. So in some respects, you don't actually, you start with this, but um, there's a couple of key aspects that I'll just revisit for a second. One is that you're starting with the customer, the end user, the end output criteria, their criteria for acceptance and working your way backwards. Ultimately, it is a little bit like um, subway tunneling, you know, or going under the English channel or something, you're coming in from both ends because you're also having to deal with what's happening at the beginning of your process. But um, from a mapping standpoint, really uh, for a particular process, it's the end consumer's criteria that, that um, and that, that, that is very true <clears throat> for the last process in your organization before you send something out the door like a absolute checklisted um, management report to a client where you've reviewed it and QA'd it and it's good to go to the client um, and outdoor that last process, of course, that's all being undertaken with the end consumer customers uh, uh, acceptance criteria in mind. You want no mistakes in that document going out the door. So we start with that and we work backwards. Uh, and it's similar in, 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 a, in any service setting or manufacturing that the, in the very last process before things go to the, the real customer, not a, like an external one, not an internal one. We start with that and work our way back. Those are really great tools and techniques. Um, the SIPOC, I think is a really yeah. great tool and, te and template that you've shown that um, can get people started off and it really gives them great guidance. Um, with this, what could be an overwhelming task for people who haven't done work process mapping previously, um, you know, yeah. following the steps and just filling in the blanks, I think really would help an organization to start um, mapping their processes. And then, yeah, the tie-in to the visual uh, depiction with the swim lane uh, template is also valuable, I think, for um, organizations to understand the um, process of process mapping as well. So Tracy, I'll just, I'll say that this, this could be used uh, both the sidewalk and the swim lane it, 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 in a small shop, a small, an SME can definitely take on process mapping in this way. It needn't be all kinds of complexity. It really, it really doesn't need to be. It's just a, it, it forces the um, team, the group to uh, understand, you know, oh, I didn't, you know, are we making a decision here at this point? And, you know, it's a yes, no type of decision. And so I didn't even know we did that, you know, and, and so that's where that kind of um, a set of tasks and a set of decisions in a particular process really comes to light when you sort of lay this out in front of uh, people. And it can be a quite a small operation to, to really, but out of it, you get both a clear understanding of what's going on now 
And then you get a, a really, uh, in some ways, almost immediate kind of understanding of uh, what it is that could be done to improve the process. And that's where I want to go next. So let's say an organization has designed their processes. They've documented all the steps. They followed the, yeah. the template and, and they've got a good set of work process maps now. Um, and they've shared them amongst all of the stakeholders and it's working pretty well. Now what, yeah. they, now what can they do? How can they use that information to improve their processes? Yeah. So this is where things get really interesting. Because, uh, um, you know, people, especially the, the people, and again, back to engaging everyone involved or everyone, everyone who touches the process, uh, they will know intuitively um, where the process needs to be improved. They, they may have actually been, you know, singing it from the, root, from the rooftops for months uh, X, Y, Z in the process needs to be changed or fixed. Or, or they, everyone will have a, 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 a lot of people will have a good idea of what really needs to occur um, in terms of uh, that, that aspect. Um, and so you need to listen to all of that and take it into account. Now, there's a, there are a couple of very complex and uh, quite well-known uh, methodologies around process improvement, like Kaizen, the, the Japanese system that is really at the heart of the just-in-time um, uh, process that we kind of have heard a, a lot about, especially lately, uh, for reasons I'll get into in a little bit. But uh, or uh, TQM, for example, which is a methodology, and a lot of these lend themselves to manufacturing setting. It has to be said, although you could you can run service uh, service. Um, Operation. I mean, the, the retail chain Zara is an amazing example of a, a large global retail chain implementing the Toyota production system, which was based on Kaizen principles, uh, across their manufacturing, distribution, and retail network. In in a uh, well, was very successful. I'm not sure if they don't know if they still use it, but it was a well known uh, example of a big operator in one sector taking on the uh, process improvement methodology from a completely different, un you know, unrelated, the automobile sector. I mean, who, who would have thought that you could apply automobile manufacturing principles to, to making um, I don't know, sweaters or, you know, but it, and distributing those. So, but to simplify things entirely, there's a very, uh, I, I think, simple, uh, plan do check act this is the this is the um, or as w edwards damming talked about it as plan do study act slightly different and he had a slightly different definition for that third stage but plan do check act is to plan um, and part of planning is identifying where the non-conformance may be occurring where the problem step is whatever in the process and to plan the change. So uh, understand what, the, what needs to change in, in the process step and, and plan that change. Uh, do is to actually implement on a small scale, test scale, the, uh, the change. And then the check uh, is to monitor the success or otherwise of uh, the results of that small scale change, the test change. Um, I mean, to implement this just system-wide immediately is, is uh, foolish, but uh, to do it on a test level is, is, can be very productive. You, you check to uh, monitor the, the new change and determine whether it's effective and successful, and then you act, and that is on the basis of those results of that monitoring, uh, that check stage, where you determine that, okay, we're going to implement this change now across across the entire process, across the, the system, whatever, um, or not, as the case may be, where we don't like the results of the check stage and we we go back and revisit the, we go back to plan and, and the initial stage of plan is to identify the, the problem area. Now there's, um, at the heart of that is a, it's an iterative approach 
uh, actually that concepts like um, um, you know project management concepts like agile use that iterative approach it's really plan do check act on a kind of a weekly basis um, where you you certainly plan and you do and then you you check you test for non-conformances etc um, and then you either in theory, you go back and iteratively fix things, which is what happens in agile, or things work out from the get-go. But either either way, you're you're kind of uh, it's a term I don't like, but you're failing fast or whatever. But uh, I tend not to sort of dwell on that aspect of it. It's more of a for me anyway, a buzzword that doesn't really apply in an in an excellent setting. But but it certainly cuts the time involved in uh, agileness in in determining whether you've come up with something successful or not. So it's all it, that it's uh, in as much as plan do check act is iterative. Um, it affords you an opportunity to go back and start again uh, if you need to. Um, there's an, the, just one more concept I wanted to just talk about in terms of uh, improving the process. And uh, an Israeli uh, practitioner named Goldblatt came up with the theory of constraints, which is actually really interesting. <clears throat> there was a great book that he wrote called The Goal. And um, uh, I read it many years ago in well, early 2000s, I guess it came out, uh, I believe. So his concept or his model was that every process somewhere in the line in the process has a constraint, something that's hindering the process from from being better and that that hindrance uh could be um sort of uh, occasional equipment issues uh you know non um uh, non-functioning equipment or uh it might be uh, people training or something something where there's a bottleneck occurring and so uh and the bottleneck is not just a timing bottleneck although that definitely has part of it but where the output from the process is uh, uh, at times non-conforming and so the task is to go in and find that bottleneck and eliminate it or at least buffer it in some way such that it doesn't have the impact anymore on the process so that's just another another sort of model for looking at process improvement yeah and that kind of relates to my next question which is what kinds of things should these organizations monitor with their work processes to ensure that they're meeting service or system standards? So, um, you know, the frame, the frame, the organizational excellence framework talks about benchmarking and, uh, or monitoring against required standards, which of course are customer, uh, customer standards. So, um, and, and, you know, the customer will have strict acceptance criteria at least they should um uh, certainly in most customers that I, i'm i've ever dealt with have very strict acceptance criteria and so the the the, the um, monitoring is against those standards uh by necessity and and that's you know fundamentally that's where where uh, that monitoring has to take to take place but the the key thing here is variation. A process uh, that has variation in it needs to be Im improved uh, to the point where that variation has been eliminated uh, or vastly uh, mitigated. Now there are two types of variation. One is one is the occasional random uh, variation that um, you know a, a blizzard that. Uh, causes hundreds of can flight cancellations or a system outage that causes um, a million mobile customers to lose their service. Uh, you know, these are the sorts of things that make the front page or the, make the news. And so there probably isn't a lot that management can, well, there may be uh, uh, on, on the mobile <laughs> side of things, there may be some things that management can do to, to uh, mitigate these things. But, you know, a blizzard is a blizzard. Um, on the but the, the other aspect of variation is that it's a continuous uh, variation. And so it's continuously um, producing, not all the, not, um, well, it's continuous, but it, at times, 
producing some kind of non-conformance. Now, this might be more a situation where there's an edge case um, of the use of the product, let's say, or the service, where employees don't mess, don't see it all the time or don't hardly see it at all um, and don't know how to deal with it. And so in that edge case, um, the, the uh, process is such that the results are definitely non-conforming. <laughs> you have an unhappy customer, basically, from, from this particular edge case. The customer didn't think it was an edge case. It's their case, but their use case, their situation. But it came out negatively for them in terms of their interaction with your organization. Now, that was is that because the edge case was not taken into account during the process design because the process that was in place didn't deal with this particular edge case. It dealt with all the sort of what we call you know happy path, um, main path kind of interactions and transactions, but the edge case was uh, not understood clearly or or ignored. But lo and behold, the edge case presented itself. The process will have this continuous variation in place, and it's it's um, it's actually called a common cause, and it's it's the main the main aspect is that it's there in the process, sitting there waiting for this edge case to occur. And when the edge case occurs, it will always produce that nonconformance on a continuous basis or a common basis. And there's only one way to improve that, and that has to be through management. Um, and so again, you have to dig into the process, determine whether where the edge case uh, is, is sort of falling through the cracks basically. Uh, in a service situation, let's say, and uh, uh, rectifying that step so that A, the steps themselves are altered, and B, the people that are performing the steps actually know, know how, to, how to do it, uh, you know, such that the edge case is just a good outcome now uh, for the, for, from a customer acceptance criteria standpoint, happy customer. So that's, that's what you're monitoring for, these variations whether they're, uh, and in fact, you know, you look at a, a, a blizzard, which is the, the um, um, special cause, uh, you, you have uh, plans in place and steps in place to cope with uh, a blizzard. And, uh, you know, you mitigate the number of, of cancellations if, uh, as much as possible, flight cancellations. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more of that in recent times with, sure. you know, the increase in storms that happen. And I think organizations are becoming cool. more um, cognizant of the things that they can do to help mitigate and and reduce the downtime that are caused by those kinds of events. So um, yeah, you, you speak about customers and I wanna bring in suppliers and other partners as well. And we, we advise with the organizational excellence best practice that we involve those stakeholders in the development and design of our work processes and even analyzing them. Can you describe how that can be done in practice? Certainly, I mean, uh, suppliers, and let's talk about external suppliers. Um, they are very much a part of, or should be part of process development. Uh, in as much, and many large organizations, of course, drive a very hard bargain with suppliers. If you want to supply to us, you are going to conform to a number of standards for information uh, provision and data and, you know, um, uh, enterprise resource planning, etc. Or you're just not going to be one of our suppliers. That's how that works. And that's been in place for a number of, a number of years now. Um, at the sort of SME end of things probably don't quite have that kind of bargaining power with suppliers, uh, but you can still talk to your suppliers about what sort of advanced reporting they might be able to provide, or um, you know lists of in, incoming product, for example, um, and and uh, the timing of, of that, uh, so that you can at least plan your own processes in in a more efficient fa uh, fashion. So that there's less ad hoc aspects to your own processes, and this is really, really where we're trying to. We're just trying to be less ad hoc or no ad hoc, and much more repeatable. Again, back to repeatable 
and measurable. And so for a, a, a small operation to be repeatable is a, is a really valuable thing. Now, suppliers uh, may not have the time to send one of their reps to uh, uh, come and talk to you or, or sit down with you to talk about how their, uh, uh, how their logistics work or you know, their supply chain, what their supply chain headaches may be, and they may be complex and multiple. Uh, that they're dealing with, and and um, you know we're seeing it manifested in the grocery shelves, or certainly in um, if not in food, we're seeing it in in products where we just go to the shelf uh, at a, uh, and the stuff isn't there. It's just and you know where is it now? Um, when I go to a grocery store that's a gigantic corporation, you know, or I can I can probably guess that. The, the uh, suppliers are being hauled on the carpet all the time about uh, just how are we, how is this planning going to proceed? Um, and you know, I don't know what the what those conversations are like these days. Um, probably some of them might not be very, very pleasant. But uh, and because there's a great shortage of, of product manifested product on shelves, but I mean it goes right back to shortage of labor and shortage of uh, raw materials, et cetera. So fundamentally, in answer to your question, suppliers are critical to, um, to, your, to, your, to your process and to, to improving your processes. And that goes for internal suppliers as well. So that, that what I've just said talks about external suppliers, but you have um, a particular business unit that's doing something in a process and producing an output for your process here in, in you know, my business unit. And I need to talk to those folks about uh, what that looks like and how those outputs are, are coming. They definitely need to be part of the conversation about any business improvement or process improvement that I'm uh, undertaking myself. I think that was... So yeah. What can organizations do to encourage their employees to contribute to improving work processes? So it's, it's the, uh, probably one of the best uh, employee engagement initiatives that you can undertake. Uh, and in, in not all cases, but in most cases would be quite readily uh, taken on by employees to have them engaged in, in process improvement. Now you have to make a case to them about the benefits of process improvement that it may, you know, reduce task load, um, make their life more easier, uh, 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 less ad hoc, fewer surprises, all of those sorts of things on a, on a daily basis. Um, and certainly would, for those of them who, those employees who have or feel that they have a really deep understanding of the process and, and uh, I, you know, back to my singing from the rooftops example, you know, I've known for months about how to fix this issue and nobody listens to me. This is where, this is where it's fantastic, where you can uh, engage your employees in, in process improvement. Um, I look at, for example, uh, uh, this is slightly personal experience, but, but if you look at uh, in, a, in a gym setting, uh, gyms have a lot of contracted trainers. And so um, contracted trainers uh, seem to use kind of their own system uh, for billing, for invoicing. And, and also uh, the gym has its own customer billing uh, system. And the invoices that you get are, you know, you get a couple of different invoices from two different systems, uh, probably neither of which really are satisfactory to you. You know, as a customer, you know that there's probably something that could be fixed back at the gym end of things. And so it's, it's useful for the gym to not only engage its employees, but I guess this is my way of saying that you want to also involve your contractors if possible as well in fixing a process that is producing kind of non-conformances, um, you know, that are pretty simple to, to fix, but uh, they're rooted in the fact that all, the, all these various contractors are using their own kind of way of doing things with no particular standardization. Um, that's just a very simple 
uh, explanation or a simple example, but the, the the point is that if you engage all the folks, including contractors, uh, in in the um, uh, process improvement, you can achieve a a lot of improvement quite quite quickly. Certainly, in, and in the IT world, I I know, for example, that uh, you know. Uh, employees and contractors are all working together, uh, client side and um, service provider side, to on um, working from the same page, and this is is, is a, a real shift over the last ten years or maybe more. But uh, previous previously, uh, for example, some of the improvement was trying to take place client side only being undertaken by the client and the, the vendors and the service providers weren't involved. Now, to me, to my way of understanding, it seems to be a lot more prevalent that absolutely everybody is involved in trying to um, uh, come up with a, a better process, mitigate the non-conformances, you know, with the client's interests paramount in mind. Yeah, I'd like um, looking at what, <laughs> has to be done to meet the client's expectations and the organization's expectations. And then also looking at what's in it for me from the employees or the contractor or the supplier's perspective, um, that can be encouraging to get them to help to make some changes um, that will help everybody and, and end yeah. up with win-win results, yeah. right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it, it really, it really is. You, you're just you're unlikely to get process improvement without involving everybody, and in, that includes people who actually don't don't necessarily touch the process itself. So, just shifting a little bit, um, this is a bit of a general question, but when we talk about quality in general, how are the work processes linked to quality? So. Uh, Starting from a definition of quality, I mean, uh, when I first started, in fact, even before, uh, I first heard of W. Edwards Deming uh, in the 80s when I was at, in college. And uh, we were actually, I was, I guess I was in a course or something like that that uh, briefly, briefly touched, uh, maybe in one class out of six months on quality and what was quality. <clears throat> and the instructor was definitely a guy who, uh, who I recall, and he was very attuned to, to issues around quality, even in the, in the you know, uh, early, early 19, mid 1980s. And that was, uh, he introduced me to anyone, the rest of us to W. Edwards Deming. And uh, Deming has a definition of quality that is, and I better just read this because it's important to get it correct, but, and you'd think after 40 years, I should know this down, down pat, but good quality means a predictable degree of uh, reliability and uh, usability with uh, a quality standard that suits the customer. Now, that's a pretty anodyne way, in my mind, of explaining, you know, what high quality is or good quality. But when you think about it, it's actually true. If you look at uh, a professional photographer, I'll get to the business process side at the end of this in a, in a second, but if you look at a professional photographer whose acceptance criteria for camera equipment is so high, um, you know, Deming's definition is, is a pretty uh, sort of, um, uh, it's a kind of anodyne way of describing something like a Hasselblad, you know, which is just the superb piece of equipment. And for the pro photographer, uh, there may be only, I don't know, uh, I'm not a camera expert, but only two or three camera manufacturers that can even begin to meet uh, a professional's acceptance criteria or anything made in Germany, for example, or made in Switzerland. Um, uh, these these are uh, you know products that that definitely are we know they're all high quality but you can actually describe them as um, as as just that that kind of predictable have that predictability and conformity and consistency um, within a standard 
for that's attuned to the to the customer. When you think about the opposite, so I had the honor of working with um, the late and sadly departed Professor Mohammed Zayuri, uh, and his he had a similar definition of quality and excellence. And I, again, I better just he said measures of excellence and quality mean consistency, reliability, durability, and predictability. And again, that all sounds like sort of, uh, you know, I could probably come up with a product maybe that meant that, but actually the answer is, and I'm talking about a, you know, a manufactured product. Um, uh, the answer is no, probably not. I mean, I think we've all driven cars, certainly I've driven cars where the opposite was in play. <laughs> they were unpredictable. They were not, not reliable. They were totally unreliable. Fortunately, I've had the opportunity to have a couple of vehicles that that would have met Deming's uh, criteria, but you know I've broken down the middle of a bridge, so I know what it means to to uh, you know a long time. Ago. But it wasn't a very was not a pleasant experience, and that was because the thing was old and and therefore wouldn't have met any excellence or quality criteria whatsoever. And so these kind of uh, somewhat uh, clinical descriptions of, of quality uh, from Deming and Zaire, uh, and, and indeed the description of quality in the, in the organizational excellence framework. They, they are pretty clinical and they don't sound particularly exciting, but they are, they are absolute, they are the definition of absolute true. The process has to understand what that means, what that is. And so again, uh, uh, the key sentence in Deming's line is, you know, with a quality standard that's suited to the customer. And so we want to develop our business processes or manufacturing processes, whatever, such that they meet that quality standard that's suited to the customer. And certainly in every, in every project or engagement that I've been involved in, over these, um, since the early 90s, when I first figured out what ISO 9000 was. And that was a, I'll just a brief note on a stand, set of standards like ISO 9000. Somebody handed me the binder for ISO 9002 and told me, go and do this. And I looked at this and I started to read it and the language was a bit similar to, to what I just said. It was very non-specific, incredibly uh, vague and kind of didn't uh, talk about my business, my company's business at all. And, uh, um, and I, I sort of read this, these pages over and over and over again. And by the 10th reading, I still didn't really quite know how this was all gonna happen <clears throat> because the standard is so uh, just clinical and non, non-specific uh, in terms of what the quality standard had to be. It ultimately turned out, and thanks to or consultant from Rolls Royce, that a detailed documentation of the processes involved had to be performed. That documentation had to be completely distributed out to everybody. Everybody had to be trained in the standard and the, the processes. And then as long as the process then was measured for adhering to the what was documented, you know, do what you doc or document what you do and do what you document, we would pass. And I thought. Well, one of my thoughts was, you know, what if we documented really poor procedures and, and you know, uh, they were beautifully written and, and very, very, you know, specified, but lousy. Uh, we would still pass and we did continue to do, follow the process to the letter and, and do a generally lousy job. And I was, it was a bit of a joke at the time, but I mean, uh, and in the end, the, the processes and documentation that we came up with was excellent and did work. It was effective. But uh, the, so the standards such as uh, our frameworks, they need to be interpreted for the business in question, I think is the point I'm making. And by interpreted for the business in question, I mean interpreted for the process within that business, processes within that business. So. Right. Good. Um, so my, almost my last question is the, um, relating to performance indicators. And right. so are there performance indicators that can be used to measure the success of work processes? Absolutely, of course. Uh, otherwise the 
even let alone the process, but the people involved in the process won't know where they're where they're at in terms of um, the effectiveness or efficiency or quality of output of their process at all. They, it's, these these indicators need to be uh, described um, and determined at the outset, and then and then uh, you know measured for their effectiveness. Uh, just before I go on to the types of KPIs, I'll talk about sort of an instance with a client where um, we were looking at their, uh, you know, what KPIs do you have in your in your business unit, um, you know, for for uh, measuring where your where your uh, processes are are, you know, what level of excellence are they attaining? And uh, this very uh, this relatively small business unit. Um, uh, I think a, a sort of a clerical one um, had something like 75 KPIs and um, you know they had come up with uh, and sort of probably put up a list of, of the KPIs and um, you know we, we looked at them and, and you know there were several that were very good and very very uh, germane to you know important to uh, understanding how good and effective their processes were, but the other 60 or so uh, were just so granular or so kind of irrelevant in some ways. Uh, so one of the big uh, sort of takeaways from that was like just reduce the number of KPIs down to those that are really meaningful to the process, uh, meaningful to your business unit. Uh, I think you know a lot of business units or folks uh, when they're determining KPIs, it's like some sort of contest to to sort of who can come up with the most KPIs or and kind of like hey that business unit they have you know they're operating to eighty KPIs or something like like that and and so it was um, immediately apparent that you know a vast percentage of those KPIs were were not useful and just among other things, wasted, wasted time measuring. So Professor Zairi talks about four types of, of KPIs and, and uh, his perspective was that a, a battery of KPIs that measure value creation, uh, and value creation was the, the key word here, they measure, so which KPI measures value creation within the process? And it could be a core process or a support process, but he felt that there's efficiency KPIs um, those are KPIs that monitor, you know, resources and financials, um, uh, all of which drive value creation. There are process KPIs that, uh, where the performance or the process consistency is being measured. There's delivery KPIs that talk about the actual delivery of the output uh, and support services from the, from the process. And finally, uh, and really importantly, industry KPIs, which is the sort of the benchmarking that we talk about. How are we doing in comparison to our competitors? And uh, now performance benchmarking is a really interesting, or industry benchmarking is a really interesting aspect. And I have found that a lot of clients sort of are vaguely aware of how they're doing against competitors, uh, but that they don't actually know um, where they might fall in the rankings, so to speak, um, especially the SM for SME uh, uh, enterprises. So getting a handle on what the rest of the industry is doing is, is a, 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 an important part of it. So that industry benchmarking can be very useful. If you're running uh, Hasselblad or Nikon uh, or, you know, Mercedes-Benz, you, you know where you're where you are in the rankings for sure. Uh, but if you're a uh, small to medium sized manufacturer or a uh, uh, service company uh, and a smaller uh, credit union or, or well, I the, the credit unions will have a very good idea, I'm sure. But at the SME level, where where you lie with, with, with regard to your competitors, uh, that's often not well understood. Not beyond anecdotally in any. I like how you um, brought back the value creation and, and, you know, that we started off by indicating that work processes add value to the 
organization or the business. And so then um, it makes sense that those performance indicators should measure what value is being added through those work processes. And so I yes. think that um, makes a lot of sense and, and is logical. Yes, definitely. I, I would just wrap, wrap that answer up with one more quote from Deming. And it was with regards to inspection. And I'll, uh, I don't have this completely down, you know, in front of me, but W. Edwards Deming felt that final inspection in order to uh, achieve high quality was a path to failure. Because if you're merely inspecting final output in order to pull non-conforming product before the customer actually sees those units, you're on that path to failure and it's too late. Inspection's too late. Uh, the defects, the non-conformances are already built in. And so, uh, yes, of course, final inspection and test is a, is a big part of the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the puzzle. But if the process isn't uh, rectified or improved to the point where those defects uh, are only being caught at final inspection, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. And that was Deming's perspective and that really the quality has to be built in much further back in the, um, in the process. And, and uh, I mean, like I sort of started out by saying, starting with the customer's final, uh, you know, their acceptance criteria, but the, the, the real measurement has to be taking place much further back in the process. Don't do it when the, you know, you're just looking at the final. Uh, yeah, if you're waiting so, until the end, oh, yeah. <clears throat> you're losing all that opportunity from Absolutely. the start to that point to make improvements and yes. and um, save time and gain efficiencies all yes. the way along the way. And the organizational excellence framework has all that nailed uh, about how to determine. Uh, in fact, it's the, the OEF talks about the plan, do, check, act uh, cycle and how that can be utilized to improve your processes, to implement a test improvement, measure its success, and, and uh, you know, determine whether to, to implement the, the improvement uh, on a larger scale. Um, so the OEF is very, very clear about um, all, all those aspects to try and avoid uh, a, a complete over-reliance on final final inspection. So. Eric, uh, you've shared a lot of great information and knowledge and tips with um, our audience in this podcast. I really appreciate that. My mm -hmm. last question for you is, how do you remain in the growth zone? In other words, what do you do to deepen your own growth mindset? It's uh, interesting. I mean, I, uh, you know, one has a, a lengthy career and uh, it, it's had all kinds of twists and turns. Um, and I, I think the fact that I still just really enjoy my work uh, on a daily basis is the main thing that keeps me in the growth zone um, because it keeps me sharp. Now, there are a couple of other things that I'll add is that professional development has to occur uh, on a more or less continuous basis through a given year. And so uh, all kinds of certificates and, and uh, courses or, or even just sessions and webinars and whatnot. Uh, uh, for example, the Catalyst Consulting Conference, which I found fantastic a few weeks ago, um, online, unfortunately still uh, these days, uh, out of Toronto. But, um, and indeed, I'm looking at one more certificate. I'm not done <laughs> pieces of paper just yet, uh, where I, I do want to do the ProSci change management um, certificate, uh, because while I've been dealing with change management and OCM issues with clients for years and years and years, um, I, apart from the fact that I kind of, I, I understand that a lot of the methodology is cold, uh, I would like to to get an expert from, say, a model like ProSci, ProSci to actually sort of uh, train me in in a particular in a particular method like that. So, and that will that keeps that sort of thing keeps me in the growth zone. So, my intention is sometime over the next few months to to get that. 
Um, and the other thing is that for 10 years now, I, I think I mentioned at the outset, uh, I've been teaching in the MBA program at Royal Roads University. And uh, it's a couple of times a year uh, for about 10 weeks per, per course. Um, it's a manage essentially uh, what amounts to the management consulting essentials course um, for the MBA students. Although now, nowadays there's actually some additional students coming in from additional streams. That teaching process also keeps me in the growth zone. It's uh, it's it really does it 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 in some ways requires me to stay sharp on um, the latest information or or um, and ensure that the information that I'm providing is really still in place in practice. Um, and so that that activity um, is is a really welcome addition. Um, to, to what I do, and I, I think uh, without the work and without the, without the teaching, for example, um, I mean, my life might be highly enjoyable, but I, I wouldn't necessarily be, you know, in the growth zone anymore. I guess that day will come eventually, but not yet. <laughs> yes, for all of us. Not yet. So, no. Yeah. Well, it's been great to have you. I really appreciate you sharing all this um, resource with us today. Yeah, fantastic. It's been it's been really, really uh, tremendous to do this. And, and uh, uh, I, I think it's a fantastic idea that you're, you're uh, doing the Excellence Connection podcasts. And uh, I've seen, I've watched a few of them. And uh, I think it's a really good thing to do to fundamentally promote the concepts of organizational excellence and business excellence, which is something that I firmly believe in and needs to be promoted out into the business community, into the public sector, um, and and uh, not for profit. I mean, everyone can, everyone who's running an organization <clears throat> can really start to implement some things that will make them higher performing. So, absolutely, this is all, this is all a good part of that. Thank you. Great, Tracy. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Thank you.